welcome back to your feel good breakfast show expresso here on s3 open up to some health chat and this yeah. time around we're shining the spotlight on uh, spotlight rather on uh, parkinson's which is a progressive nervous system disorder that affects movement a tremor is one of the most common symptoms of the disease and here to shed some light on parkinson's as we commemorate parkinson's disease awareness month the month of april please welcome our trusted medical health specialist uh, dr darren green dr. good morning darren green it's so good to have Always you Always good yeah. to see you here. You too, man. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check up on you, make sure you're okay. Yeah, Thank no, you for that. You know, I'm vaccinated, uh, Indeed. presumably, because you're out on the front lines, so part of a very positive story there. But that's not what we're talking about mm. this morning. We are focusing as we should, because lest we forget, mm. the rest of the world still moves on yeah. despite COVID-19. Other medical conditions yeah. are yes. still happening, um, correct. And this is a difficult, and I say this is a difficult conversation to broach because it's something that personally terrifies me, and it's something that I would imagine is unbelievably difficult for a person to go through. Parkinson's disease, we've seen it obviously in the, the form of, you know, Michael J. Fox has yes, lived well -known it figure. very mm -hmm. out loud and does a huge amount in terms of raising awareness. But from, for those of us that are uninitiated, what, what in fact is Parkinson's disease? Well, you uh, alluded to a term, neurodegenerative. That's it. And that means specifically in the brain, what happens in Parkinson's is that there are, there are neurotransmitters and we all know that the nerve, one nerve speaks to another. Mm by means of an electric signal, which is facilitated by these chemicals in the brain. And dopamine is the one that we're speaking about here, okay. the chemical. Mm. So the dopaminergic neurons or nerve cells in the brain, and specifically in an area of the brain called the substantia nigra, mm. uh, that's the area that's affected in Parkinson's disease where the, the body manufactures or makes less dopamine and those cells that manufacture the dopamine, they start degenerating and dying off. And that is what the disease entails. And that then has a manifestation on your motor system predominantly. In other words, your movement and motor system. And, uh, you know, we'll unpack it according to, mm. to those developing symptoms and signs. And I suppose that becomes one of the sort of onset symptoms that you might be able to identify it uh, by checking out. But it's a very terrifying one, right? One might ask then, what causes it? What causes Do we know? Parkinson's? Yeah. Do we even know? Can we? <laughs> is it genetic? Do do? Is it, yeah, yeah. Is so this is a lot. What we do know is the following: we know that your risk of developing Parkinson's disease increases with age. The uh, average age of onset for people that do develop it is 60 years mm. plus, and there's a prevalence of about one percent at the age of 60, mm. and uh, more than four percent at the age of 80. So age is a risk factor. Then we also know there are genetic links and components that have been established mm. for some of these. Uh, genetic transmitted forms of Parkinson's, you need both parents to have that gene. For others, obviously, you only need one. Mm. That's what we, when we speak about a recess, autosomal, recessive and dominant genes, etc. And lots of studying and research on that component. Yeah. Then there's an association also with things like pesticides, people living in rural areas, mm. wow. uh, because of obviously pesticides and yes. the effect that they can have on the brain. In the farm uh, areas. Uh, correct. And then uh, obviously things like head injury have also been implicated mm. uh, in terms of developing this, this degenerative condition. So like many motor neuron diseases, it, has, it seems to have a, a similar kind of pathology, if you will. Um, I, I suppose most people out there are asking one vital question is how do you start to recognize the symptoms? Right Does it always exhibit with tremors? Are there other ways that it can start to reveal symptoms? Yeah, my, my teacher and senior professor, Jonathan Carr at Tigerberg Hospital always taught us the, uh, the, the anagram, Trap, T-R-A-P, trap. Yeah. trap, you feel trapped. Yeah. And the T stands for tremor, okay. which is a resting tremor. In other words, even while you're just chilling, not reaching out for anything, you can start with a tremor. Mm -hmm. It can start in one hand or in both hands normally. Okay. Uh, it can be any part of the body, but generally the hands and fingers first at rest. So tremor, the R is rigidity or stiffness of the muscles. Mm. In other words, you experience a degree of stiffness that limits the speed of your movement, oh. uh, etc. as well. So that is rigidity and stiffness. The A is akinesia or bradykinesia, which means slow movement. So you've got a bit of a slower robot-like mm. movement almost because of the stiffness of the muscles, but also because of those dopaminergic neurons that are busy dying off in certain areas. Okay. Yes, correct. And then the P is postural instability, okay. where your balance is affected to a degree where if someone just bumps you, you fall over, for example, your correcting mm. reflexes to stay upright and maintain posture can be affected. And that's why a trap is a good way. But there are other associated symptoms, like your facial expression can yeah. be diminished. You could, they call it hypermimia, like a mime. 
Mm, but you yeah. can't smile and express joy and like smile. Like Botox. Mm. Yes, exactly. You yeah, no. <laughs> never thought of it like that. Yeah. But because of the stiff muscles and slowed movement, it can even affect your, your, uh, your facial muscles and oral muscles. And you could actually develop then side effects like Lewy body dementia in the brain, which is a form of dementia associated with, really? with Parkinson's as well. Would well, these symptoms Equally need to be yeah. consistent? Uh, with the moment that it shows up, for example, tremors showing up one day, and then going away, and then coming back again another time, or would they be consistent? How, yeah, so, how, how so the tremor, the, the, yeah. the most common tremor you'll find is an essential familial tremor, where people in your family have just the tremor component, mm. yeah. and uh, often you'll find that a history with the gran and, the, and, and so forth, uh, but that's normally an intention tremor. In other words, it get wor gets worse when you actually try and do a task or okay. perform a task. The resting tremor is what we refer to almost as a pull rolling tremor, where your thumb and index finger looks like you're actually counting money or rolling a coin yeah. mm. and so forth. And uh, that's quite interesting to actually uh, watch the movement uh, yeah. disorder there. So the movement disorders associated with the tremor is a highly specialized field and there are a very small handful of neurologists in the country and in the world that obviously dedicate their lives to that. Work in that space. Well, now that we have got every single one of you out there within your bodies feeling <laughs> um, to, to, to see if you can pick up any of those symptoms, I think it really does highlight the importance of this Awareness Month. The doctor is not going anywhere. I suggest you stick around as well. We are continuing our discussion um, around a vitally important topic. We are talking about Parkinson's disease. It's my feel good Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Continuing with our health discussion on Parkinson's disease with multimedia health specialist, Dr. Darren Green. He is still with us. And we are going to be getting into some of the medical conditions that are associated with Parkinson's and hopefully offer a few tips on how family and friends can better cope because I think that's a massive part of this. But there is maybe the most important question relating to Parkinson's disease in terms of what's driving the research mm -hmm. at the moment and the awareness, is there a cure? How do we cope with it? How do we treat it? Yeah, so at the moment, there isn't a cure to reverse Parkinson's disease. Let's start off there. At the moment, there, there are interventions to help manage the degenerative condition and give you a decent quality of life mm. with all these effects that you're having on your motor system, your movement, your degree of dependence and so forth. We've mentioned the tremor, the rigidity, the, the slow movement and the stiffness, etc. Et but when we look at all that, uh, you must remember that the problem essentially is too little dopamine, the neurotransmitter. So you can take that synthetically and certain uh, forms of Parkinson's disease are dopamine responsive. In other words, they respond well balance that to out. taking okay. synthetic dopamine. Mm. Now, you need dopamine that can actually get into the brain. So there's different types that you get in formulations that can cross the blood-brain barrier, get into the brain, and the brain can utilize that to help you know, uh, you know, optimize the amount of neurons you have left and using them as, as best you possibly yeah. can. So that's one thing. The big challenge with the medication in, in synthetic dopamine is that it has side effects on other systems in the body. So you must use as little as possible and as late as possible in the condition, in other words, when you really need it, because you've got a certain amount of years that you can actually utilize that medication and, and the window gets smaller and smaller and smaller due to tolerance and due to, obviously, as I've mentioned, the, the side, side effect effects. profile on yeah. others. And the side effects can be quite significant in other sis, uh, you know, systems. So there are quite a few uh, medical oh, treatment options. Pharma, yeah. as I say, a few other things you can do as well. Well, that's a chat on cure and the fact that we've established now that there isn't a cure necessarily, but a management system, as it were. Uh, we always go, go on about prevention is better than cure, but is yeah. there a way to prevent getting Parkinson's disease? So looking, <laughs> interesting, there was some <laughs> literature on caffeine and coffee being mm. protective oh, against Parkinson's. Oh, protective? Yeah. Okay, God. well, oh, God. that Thank is good you. news. So for those of you that, that like doing some uh, good evidence-based research, <laughs> that's a lovely, <laughs> lovely weekend reading, yeah. uh, obviously as well. Yeah. But uh, as I mentioned, obviously, exposure to things like pesticides, uh, unfortunately, you can't change your family, you know your yeah, family. Your but genes are your but genes, the intervention yeah. and, and the lit literature looking at which genes are, in, are involved, firstly, mm. but also the pattern of inheritance mean that if you 
you have a certain pattern in your family, you might be able to find out in advance, obviously, and plan accordingly. So that's also important. Uh, and then we, I, I didn't mention the electric part of treating Parkinson's, which mm. is deep, deep brain the brain stimulation. is electric, yeah. The yeah, brain is Where is certain is electrodes, electrodes are, are, yeah. are, are implanted, mm. there's a certain uh, site in the brain, to facilitate, obviously, the conduction and the motor signals in these dopaminergic pathways. And that then helps as well for, for a significant amount of people. Mm. So, but variable results, not everyone responds favorably to that, mm. but it has certainly been useful in, in certain populations. And obviously there's a cost implication as well. I would imagine the discussion becomes really interesting when we start talking about associated conditions. Mm. What is often accompanied with this? How, how can Good. you kind of put it in its broader family tree? 100%. If you will. So if we speak about conditions that have too little dopamine in the brain, we speak about idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is what I've described to you thus far. Then you have another interesting group, which is called the Parkinson's plus syndromes. In other words, they have Parkinson's disease yeah. plus other medical problems. It's triggering problems. something else. Yeah, and one of, of them is, else. One of okay. them is called MSA or multiple system atrophy. Mm. Uh, and there are two main subtypes, A and C. The A is for autonomic dysfunction, where you know your fight or flight system, the yeah. sympathetic, parasympathetic system, the autonomic features and nervous system is affected by that condition. So low blood pressure, problems with voiding, problems with your, your bowel control, that kind of oh, thing can okay. happen. And then the other form of multiple system atrophy involves the cerebellum. Uh, that term we all loved saying at school. <laughs> and that controls your, your, your coordination mm. and your walking, uh, etc. And then there's one other one called PSP, which is progressive supranuclear palsy, where your eyes and your upward gaze is impaired and you develop rigidity and stiffness in the neck oh. with an off the pillow sign where your neck protrudes forward with stiff muscles in the neck, etc. And your eyes also can't move like they should move. Yeah. So those are really tough because there aren't reversible cures for yeah, those sure. conditions. Yes. And that makes have to it, live with really that and manage that. Correct. And the people who often have to deal with and manage that are often, I suppose, if someone's a sufferer of Parkinson's disease, your family, your loved ones, your friends. 100%. What are the tips that you can share on how uh, we can be supportive uh, and, and, and really cope with Parkinson's disease, number one, if you are a sufferer, but also if you are a loved one? I think the first thing is you, you can't do it alone. Mm. You need to plug into a network where you are speaking to other people going through the same thing. And a sure. support group is very useful mm. to realize it's okay to be frustrated, exhausted, tired sometimes from preventing burnout of the carer, for mm. example. That's the first thing. The second thing that you need to do as a family member, obviously, is try and share the load if you can. Uh, but it's not always that easy. When you're living in a metropole, in a city, a big city, yeah. you've got access to a lot more than you do if you're living in a rural area. And that's yeah. part of the infrastructure challenges that we have here in South Africa as well, is bringing and educating people in those committees, uh, in those communities. Socioeconomic. Yeah. Socioeconomic thing. So there's a lot we can do in that sense. So that's the first thing. Early diagnosis, mm -hmm. compliance with medication, yes. recognizing the side effects and those systemic side effects that I mentioned to taking medication are also important. Things like constipation, for example, things like nightmares and screaming in your sleep. Those are things and hallucinations that can be managed by the, the, the treating specialist uh, if they are aware of yeah, the symptoms. Of what's going wow. on. You are Thank you, not Dr. alone. Dr. Green. I think the overriding yeah. message here during uh, Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, we're going to take some of your calls and your comments and questions on social media. You can give us a shout. 21 110 if you have any questions to ask the good doctor. He is sticking around. It's my feel-good Yes, welcome back to it, your favorite <sighs> breakfast show, Expresso. We're continuing a very, very interesting and very insightful conversation with multimedia health specialist, Dr. Darren Green, who's here, standing by to answer all of your burning questions on Parkinson's disease as we continue to observe mm. uh, that Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month this April is taking place. Now, thank you once again to every single one of you who've sent through your questions, but I believe we do have a caller on the line all the way out in Durban. We've got Wendy. Wendy, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning Wendy. Thanks for, for weighing in. What is your question for the doc? I would like to know what foods or supplements would be the best for increasing one's levels of dopamine, since the lack of that is the thing that causes yeah. the Parkinson's. Very good question. 
Great question. So remembering that dopamine is actually the neurotransmitter in the brain mm. that is involved with the reward pathway. So movement, as I've mentioned, mm. but also reward. So you naturally do so much in your day-to-day -day living mm. that can actually help stimulate, stimulate dopamine release. Mm. One of them are just surrounding yourself with positive people mm. that <laughs> aren't my negative baby. and giving you critique all the time yeah. and bad criticism. Yeah. In other words, positive feedback mechanisms. Yes. In other words, doing an activity and finding things that give you small wins yeah. those are natural ways of increasing your dopamine remember though that the problem in this case is that the actual cells that are involved in the dopamine pathway are actually de degenerating and regenerating those cells to form new cells is where the research is going and wh what we actually want to do with future mm. therapy so at the moment I can say surround yourself with positive people mm. obviously in terms of diet and nutrients Eating a good, uh, healthy, balanced diet in yeah. terms of macro and micronutrients will facilitate you not getting other conditions, medical conditions, mm -hmm. like high blood pressure, blood vessel conditions that like atherosclerosis that precipitate strokes and other medical conditions mm -hmm. that will accelerate, obviously, the, 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 the loss of function in Parkinson's okay. disease. So you want to be making sure that you're doing as much as you can, Wendy, that's going to give you joy and keep you in that positive space. Correct. Thank you very much. And hopefully that answers your question, Wendy Art in Durban. And we're still staying in Durban. We've got another caller in Durban. It's Sean. Sean, good morning. Good morning. Hi, morning. Morning, sir, for having me on the show. Mm, thanks, morning, man. Sean. What's your question, yeah. Sean? Yeah, basically, it's with regards to my 12-year-old daughter. Uh, it's only when she goes to bed, she's like having a seizure. And we've been to the pediatrician. We've been to so many GPs. They put her on a medication called Epilim. And now it's going like 14 days, but it's only at night that... She's getting involuntary movements on her hands, legs. Mm. There's a foot that leaks out her mouth. And then she goes into like a deep sleep kind of thing and we have to get her up. Uh, like, we, we, like so we feel like something's going to happen to her. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it sounds terrifying to say the least. As a parent. So, so, yes, yeah, certainly yes. from a parent's yeah. perspective. Yeah, so seizures and epilepsy are obviously unrelated to this conversation on mm -hmm. Parkinson's. However, there are specific epilepsy syndromes associated in childhood mm -hmm. up to the age of 12. I think he mentioned his daughter is the age. 14. Yeah. yeah. So if it's older than the age of 12, certainly one would want to have a look at what they call continuous monitoring. Yeah where they actually admit you to the hospital for a, for a week, especially if the seizures are recurrent, recurrent. And then what they do is they look at which part of the brain the mm. seizure originates from. And then uh, with the imaging, we can correlate, obviously, what the cause is, if there's anything structural to worry about or not, and then obviously refer and treat ac accordingly. She's on a medication, an anticonvulsant medication called Epilim. Uh, that she's mentioned, and uh, obviously compliance is good. But I think keeping a diary of those, the nighttime nocturnal Episodes. seizures is also a type of seizure that you get. Mm -hmm. But normally at the age of 12, uh, that's, that can obviously dissipate, but in, in terms of childhood. But if she's 14, mm -hmm. certainly worth a follow up and worth long term monitoring. All right, well. so get into a, a doctor's room as soon as you can, I think. Um, some enlightening and, and again, rather scary facts being raised today. Thank you so much for taking us through that conversation. It is uh, a very, very difficult time for any family to deal with, any person to have to go through this. So I think the most important take home here is that we need to stand together as a community looking yeah. for answers.